While we usually think about the British colonial period in terms of the 13 original colonies that would break away from England and form the initial members of the United States, few students are aware that there were actually 32 British colonies in North America, including those in Canada, the West Indies, and the Florida Isles. In this unit, we will explore key demographic information about the 13 original colonies that influenced their social, economic, and political structures in a way that would create a uniquely American way of life. Rapid population growth to North America took place during the 18th century. On this page, we can see comparisons between uh, figures at the turn of the century next to those at the beginning of the American Revolution. In 1700, roughly 300 people were living in the British colonies along the Atlantic coast. Most of these people had migrated from England with the exception of about 20,000 African slaves. By the American Revolution, the rebellious colonies had a population of about 2.5 million people, half of which were black. It is important to note that natural increase was responsible for over half of this population boom. 800,000 people migrated to the mainland colonies in this 75 years. 400,000 of them were forced migrants, slaves from the west coasts of Africa. The remaining 1.4 million new souls were born in North America and were not likely to see Europe in their lifetimes. Loyalty to the crown was valued, but the, col the colony was home. Not only was time and distance diluting the American colonists' loyalty to the crown, but the American colonies were also outgrowing their mother country. The population of British North America was doubling every 25 years. England's population had been 20 times greater than that of North American colonies in 1700. But on the eve of the Declaration of Independence, England's advantage was only three times as populated. Furthermore, the American spirit taking hold during the 18th century was also perpetrated by its youth. The average age in the colonies during the American Revolution was 16. As the population in British North America ballooned, overpopulation and restrictions on westward migration would create conflict with the crown. Most of the colonists lived east of the Appalachian Mountains, but a few pioneers like Daniel Boone were starting to venture into eastern Tennessee and Kentucky in the 1760s. The most populous colonies at the outbreak of the American Revolution were Virginia and Massachusetts. Pennsylvania, North Carolina, and Maryland followed. By and large, people lived in rural areas. 18th century British America boasted only four cities, New York, Boston, Charleston, and the largest, Philadelphia, which had fewer than 35,000 people. That's about the size of Kearney, Nebraska today. The melting pot of American culture also influenced the fate of the original 13. From the outset of the 18th century, a substantial influx of non-English immigrants settled in British territory with no deep-rooted loyalty to the crown. German Protestants, mostly Lutheran, fleeing persecution and war amongst the Germanic kingdoms, settled mainly in Pennsylvania. Taking advantage of the colony's liberal religious toleration policies and unsettled land in the West, these Germans became known as the Pennsylvania Dutch which is a mispronunciation of the German word for German. That word is Deutsch. America was already a nation of diverse nationalities in the colonial period. This map shows the great variety of immigrant groups, especially in Pennsylvania and New York. It is also illustrating the tendency of later arrivals particularly the Scots-Irish, to push into the back country. As discussed in chapter three, this often created conflict with Western tribes. 
Another group of transplants to Pennsylvania with no love for the British government were the Scots-Irish. These Scottish Protestants had been evicted by England landlords and transplanted to Northern Ireland, where they fought the soil and the Irish Catholic natives. Protestant Catholic conflict and terrorism generated by history still plagues Northern Ireland today. At the turn of the 18th century, tens of thousands of Scots-Irish attempted to escape their misery and came to the British colonies with the hopes of establishing independent farms. Finding that almost all of the land in eastern Pennsylvania had been settled, this ethnic group became the first Europeans to settle in mass west of the Appalachian Mountains. But conflict followed the Scots-Irish, or at least they brought conflict with them as they attempted to squat in Native American territory. The tribes of the West pushed many of these rough and tumble settlers southward into the Shenandoah Valley, which is in present day West Virginia, and from there into the backwoods of North and South Carolina. The ramshackle cabins the Scots-Irish built speak to their nomadic experience in the 18th century. The Scots-Irish ambition to settle along the western fringes of the British colonies had several significant impacts on American history. First, the flare-ups of violence between white settlers like the Scots-Irish and Indian communities would lead British government to prohibit settlement west of the Appalachians after 1763. Antagonized by government policies that they did not respect, they lashed back with force. One such example of the resentment Scots-Irish squatters had towards government is the Conestoga Massacre of 1764, perpetrated by the Paxton Boys. Angered by hostile Indian attacks on backwood settlements and the Quaker government's lack of retaliation, a group of Scots-Irish from Paxtang, Pennsylvania, formed a mob, marched to the town of Lancaster, where uh, the last 16 members of a nearly extinct Susquehanna tribe were being sheltered. They brutally murdered all but two of the last of these members. Emboldened, the Paxton boys then marched to the colonial capital of Philadelphia, where they planned another attack on Indians under the protection of the government. Further bloodshed was prevented when Benjamin Franklin intervened as a negotiator. Franklin diffused the situation by promising the mob's leader that he would relay their concerns to the colonial government. The men who committed genocide against the Susquehanna returned to their farms and were never brought to justice. Fiery Scots Irish immigrants also instigated a revolt against the colonial governor of North Carolina in 1771, just four short years before the first battle of the American Revolution. In fact, some historians refer to the Battle of Alamance Creek as the first unofficial battle of the Revolutionary War because farmers of the western part of that colony, many of whom were Scots-Irish immigrants, organized an armed resistance against the crown-appointed governor over issues of taxation without representation. The rebellion became known as the Regulator Movement, for the participants desired to rein in lavish spending of Governor Tryon and his tax collector, Edmund Fanning. The stories of the Scots-Irish are essential to understanding how British settlement policy following the French and Indian War, as well as the changing composition of the British colonies, would influence the movement for American independence. One good way to remember the Scots-Irish and their contribution to the development of American culture is to remember they got spirit and they brought spirits because they had brawled their way from Ireland and down the back country of the Appalachian Mountains and the scotch Iris were rugged individualists, meaning they paved their own way with the sweat of their brow and didn't give a damn for anyone uh, that was in their way. This work ethic and love for independence, as well as their quarrelsome nature, have been woven together into the American character. The Scots 
also happily spread their tradition for distilling whiskey, which I'm sure is also part of what played a role in their strong character, right? This is a primary account of the Conestoga massacre. There are few, if any, murders to be compared with the cruel murder committed by, on the Conestoga Indians. The first notice I had of this affair was that while at my father's store near the courthouse, I saw a number of people running down the street. At about 60 or 80 yards from the jail, we met with 25 or 30 men well mounted on horses and with rifles, tomahawks and scalping knives, equipped to murder. I ran into the prison yard and there, oh, what a horrid sight presented itself to my view. Near the back door of the prison lay an old Indian and his wife, practically well known and esteemed by people of the town on account of his placid and friendly conduct. His name was Will Sock. Across him and his wife lay two children of about the ages three years, whose heads were split with a tomahawk and their scalps all taken off. Toward the middle of the jail yard, along the west side of the wall, lay a stout Indian, whom I particularly noticed to have been shot in the breast. His legs were chopped off with a tomahawk, his hands cut off, and finally a rifle ball discharged in his mouth so that his head was blown to atoms and the brains were splashed against and yet hanging on to the wall for three or four feet around. This man's hands and feet had also been chopped off with a tomahawk. In this manner lay the whole of them, men, women, and children spread about the prison yard, shot, scalped, hacked, and cut to pieces. At the outset of the American Revolution, nearly half, about 49%, of the British North American population was Anglo-Saxon, meaning they or their ancestors originated from England. Other European immigrant groups peppered the colonies, French Calvinist Protestants called Huguenots, the Welsh, meaning people from Wales, which was England's neighbor to the West, the Dutch, the Swedes, Irish, Swiss, Scots Highlanders and Jews made up less than 5% of the total population. But by far and away, Africans were the largest non-English group. By 1775, 20% of the colonial population, roughly a half a million people, were Africans. 90% of these forced migrants lived in the southern colonies. Based on surnames or last names, this particular chart shows the ethnic and racial composition of people in America in 1790. Although the majority of people in the British American colonies were predominantly white, Anglo-Saxon and Protestant, the composition was the most diverse in the world of all the regions, the middle colonies were more diverse than, and Puritan New England was the least. When the Battle of Lexington and Concord would officially inaugurate the American Revolution, half of the people living in the original 13 colonies were not English. As a model of the unique American identity, the founding fathers that signed the Declaration of Independence reflected this diversity. 18 of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence, that's roughly one in three, did not come from English origin. Furthermore, these men were by and large not immigrants. All but eight had been born in British North America. As these groups mingled and intermarried, they laid the groundwork for a new national identity that of American. The natural birth rate of black slaves would also give rise to the African American community, which would fuse together the diverse array of cultures that had been fractured on the slave coasts of Africa, and in a similar way, 
Forced migration of tribes from the east beyond the Appalachian Mountains blended communities together in a way that led to the loss of many tribes' distinctive character. 